Game design is not a fundamental human skill. Some of us are better at art at drawing than others. Some are better at throwing things, or speaking extemporaneously, or better at math, or better at communicating with children. Of course, you can get better at any of these things over time, but the fact remains is some people start with an edge. If you're better at throwing things than I am, then even if I practice, the only way I can catch up to your skill on throwing things is if you don't practice and I manage to surpass you. Game design, however, and these images are a number of my favorite designers. Game design is different. It is a whole bunch of different abilities that go together to make up the that one skill. It's possibly dozens or hundreds of abilities. Paradoxically, this means that because everyone is complicated and lots of abilities, you don't need one skill to be a designer, you need hundreds, so all of us have hundreds of skills. We can all find some way to fit our hundreds of skills together to be a designer. In theory, anyone can be a designer. No, I've been told I'm a pretty good designer. Certainly, I've won awards. But the fact is that I've been designing games as my main job since 1938. Sure, I've got good at it by now. I have an edge on new designers. They might be smarter, they might be more artistic, they have more useful talents, but at least I got the edge in experience. But to succeed as a designer, you need more than brains. You need other traits. And I'm gonna talk about these, the three of the most important traits you need to be a designer. Now, I'm not saying if you don't have these traits, you're certain to fail, but it'll be harder for you to get your game out there. So the first, you have to really, really like games. I design games all day long. One of my favorite activities to relax on weekends is playing games. At family reunions, Uncle Sandy pulls out games or invents games for other people to play. When I'm engaged in light conversation at dinner time with friends, the conversation, if I get a chance to steer it, goes to games. When I watch a movie, I try to think about how some plot point or some effect could be modeled in a game. I am constantly steeped in games. Now, you may not be as obsessed with games as I am. Lord knows it has drawbacks. But you have to at least like games so much that you're willing to forego some other pleasures in order to do games instead. So that's the first thing, obsessed with games. That makes it a lot easier to be a designer. Second, be creative. You're probably going, duh, of course you have to be creative, but there's more to it. You see, there's lots of different ways of being creative. Let me give you an example. I used to work with a man named Greg Stafford. We were both creative, but we were creative in highly different ways. Greg's creativity came from the root. He would invent things out of whole cloth, including an entire fantasy universe, Glorantha. Now, he originally devised it to write fantasy books, but it turned into games and comics and art and uh, digital games and all kinds of things. Uh, he was a fount of creation, spewing out interesting concepts constantly. Now, I worked very closely with him, but I am not his kind of creative. I am what you'd call a syncretic designer, though I do come up with some things on my own, Mostly what I do is I pick and take ideas from different sources and I work these together to make a coherent new whole. So Greg would come up with some crazy idea and I'd listen to him and I'd remember some other idea he had a year ago or some movie I saw or some science book I'd read and I would, uh, on a related topic, and figure out how these things go together. I also carried things to a logical conclusion, which Greg didn't bother with. He wasn't interested in the logical conclusions, he wanted the ideas. So for example, Greg said, the moon in Glorantha has phases, just like Earth's moon. Okay, so here's the, here's the moon, it's called the red moon, and it goes through phases. And I would say, okay, so why does it have phases? The moon in Glorantha sits above the, the flat world. There's no cosmos, it's just Glorantha. And, and, and like, it doesn't move, it doesn't orbit it or anything, it just stays there. So what's with the phases? Uh, so what's eclipsing the moon? So I conjectured to, to, to Greg, I said, well, why is this, this, maybe the moon is dying and being reborn and the black thing covering the moon is its death. And then uh, that's what makes the phases. Then later on ago, a few months ago, I was thinking about it some more. I said, hey, Greg, what if there's a dark object 
orbiting the moon and its shadow, it's actually eclipsing it. And that's what makes um, the, the moon. So Greg liked both these ideas, but he didn't pick between him. He apparently forgot. And he used both those in different times. He'd mentioned the moon and mentioned them. I guarantee he forgot what you like better. So perhaps they can be combined. I said, maybe there's an unknown object orbiting the moon that kills the moon as it goes over and makes it turn black and it's invisible. Um, so anyway, you can see how Greg has the idea it has phases Then I had to work to make this make any kind of sense logically. Greg would also invent cults or religions and I had to turn them to something useful to play in because the world of Grantha is kind of about religion and myth and having a cult that no one would ever join makes no sense. I always had my eye on what idea would be fun for players. To Greg, it was fun just to have the creative energy. He just liked making stuff up. But the combination of his fount of, of invention and my focus on playability led to some really great adventures. Now, I'm telling you this to show you how two different designers, both creative but in different ways, got together to forge this universe of Glorantha. It's one of the reasons I've been effective in doing a lot of Lovecraftian projects because I have the data, my, with my syncretic design, we have all this data from Lovecraft and other horror guys and horror movies and science. And it's easy for me to take ideas from that and put it together and make new holes. So even though there's not a cult of the black goat ever described, I'm able to work together a logical black goat cult which we'll get to in another video um, and, and uh, you know, get something good out of it. Now, another feature of being a solid game designer is that you have to be able to deliver. Now, a lot of game designers are stereotyped as lazy bums who won't move, move out of mom's basement, or maybe that's programmers, I don't know. Uh, of course, there's lazy bums out there, but they're not good game designers. Game designers have to be self-starters. You have to aggressively pursue your design or you will never get it done. You need confidence in your project. You have to say, this is gonna work, I'm gonna do it. Doesn't mean you don't take feedback, you better. But it does mean that you need to push forward and get that thing going and constantly be working on it. Now, as far as taking feedback, I'll get into that. Also in another video, we'll, get, we'll talk about how I play test. My career in design, I'm gonna show you how these three things go together, being obsessed, being creative, and being able to deliver. I got my start by writing the role-playing game Call of Cthulhu. Now, I had done a couple small things for Chiasium, but Greg Stafford basically dropped the entire massive Call of Cthulhu role-playing game in my lap and said, here, do this. So why did Greg do that? Now, at the time, I didn't think about it, but I had no idea. But later, he told me it was for these three reasons. First, I was a huge fan of Lovecraft. I loved Lovecraft. He wasn't, but he wanted someone obsessed to write the game. So, I was obsessed. Second, he knew I could write because I'd done a few things for him already. Enough that he was able to look at what I'd done and say, hey, he's creative, he's got the idea, he can do it. He's creative, he's creative enough to handle the Call of Cthulhu game. But third, and most important, I had never missed a deadline. So Greg could trust me. Of these three features, he told me that he valued the fact that he knew I'd deliver as the most critical. This makes sense because it doesn't matter how obsessed or how creative or how knowledgeable you are about the subject, subject, if you don't finish the design, you will never have a game. The world is full of creative, intelligent people, even obsessed people, who in fact have dead-end jobs, no visible future because they've never learned to capture their imagination and use that creativity to, well, create. If you have these three traits, you will find it much easier to create a design. You can probably do it if you lack one of the traits, but all the most successful designers I know show these features. And now you know.